Hello students, welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, we are going to study evidence for evolution. Evidence for evolution is anything that can be used to prove evolution or the available body of facts or information that indicate whether a belief or proposition on evolution is true or valid. The main source of evidence for evolution is paleontology, comparative embryology, comparative anatomy, comparative biochemistry, and animal and plant breeding. The first source of evidence for evolution is paleontology. The word paleontology comes from Greek words paleos, which means ancient, and logos, study that refers to the study of the ancient life forms. This paleontology to provide evidence for evolution, it significantly depends on fossil records. What is fossil? Fossil is derived from Latin word fossas, which means having been dug up. Fossils means the dead remains or traces of animals plants and other organisms from the remote past. So, fossils are the main direct evidence about the past life. We can group fossils into two main categories. Category 1 include the remains of dead animal or plant or the imprint left from the dead remains, including bones, teeth, skin impressions, hair, feather, the hardened shell of an ancient invertebrate such as a trilobite, an ammonite, and the impression of the dead remains of animal or plant even if the actual dead parts are missing. The second category, category 2, that are something that was made by the animal while it was living that has been hardened into stone. These are called trace fossils. These trace fossils include footprints, burrows, eggshells, and coprolites that the animal left while it was alive. How do fossils form? Clearly, death of the organism, for some reason or other, is the first stage. But death is nearly always associated with decomposition, which obviously doesn't happen when fossils are formed. So, how is this prevented? Or just how do fossils form? There are four main stages. The first stage is death without decomposition. To start with, an animal or plant must die in or so close to the water that it is covered by water immediately after or shortly after death. The water insulates the dead remains from many of the elements that can contribute to decomposition. Bacteria will still decay the soft body parts over a long period, but leave any hard body parts unaltered. The second step for fossilization is sedimentation. As time passes, sediments or landslides and mudslides or tiny particles of solid matter settling out of the water to bury the remaining hard parts of the organism. Fossilization is more likely if this happens quickly into the water. The chemical nature and weights of the sediments have its own effect on the nature and quality of the fossil. For example, very fine grained particles like clays will create a more detailed fossil, whereas coarser grained sediments like sands do not make detailed fossil. The chemical makeup of the sediments affect the color of the fossil. That means, for example, iron-rich sediments could give the rock or the fossil a reddish color. 
whereas phosphates may darken the rope or the fossil so that the rope or the fossil looks gray or black. The third stages of fossilization is permineralization. As the sediments accumulate, the lower layers become compacted by the weight of the top layers of the sediment. Over time, this pressure turns the sediments into rock. Then, if the water that is rich in minerals percolate or seeps through the sediments, the mineral particles stick to the particles of the dead remain, that means effectively gluing or attaching with the dead remain or exoskeleton. Over the course of millions of years, this Mineral particles dissolve away the original hard parts of the organism or the dead remain and then replacing the molecules of the exoskeleton or dead remain with molecules of calcite and another mineral substances. In this time, the entire shell of the dead remain or exoskeleton is replaced by mineral particles and the dead remains or exoskeleton are compressed into rock in the shape of the original organism. The fourth fossilization step is uplifting. This is the mechanism in which the continental plates move around the earth or earth movement, in which certain parts of the earth colliding with each other to form mountains. In this case, what were sea floors are lifted up and become dry land, whereas the upper surfaces of the land are moved down and buried deep inside the ground. Now, the fossil can be buried under hundreds or even thousands of feet of rock in different strata. Uplifting is not always a mechanism to facilitate fossilization, but also it can disturb fossilization. That means it can let fossils from deep inside the ground to be lifted up and exposed to the Earth's surface. That means the Earth's movements cause rocks to slip and parts of different strata to become exposed. Rock that contains fossils becomes lifted to the Earth's surface. In this case, Rain, wind, earthquakes, freeze, and saw erode rock and may expose a fossil. How a dinosaur's fossil is formed? Let us take a look step by step. First, there must be days of dinosaur within water or so close to the water in order to be covered soon before the dead body of the dinosaur is eaten or disturbed or rotten. This led fossilization. Then there must be sedimentation. That means the dead body of dinosaur must be covered by sand, mud, ice, ash or other sediments. This led the dead bodies of dinosaur quickly buried. In this case, fossilization is ongoing. After many times later, the sediment covers the dead remains or dead organisms. That means the dead bodies of dinosaur is completely covered and left undisturbed. Suitable conditions for fossilization must exist. That is, the temperature, pressure, acidity, chemicals, moisture and sediments must be suitable for fossilization to take place. When good conditions exist for fossilization, recrystallization or permineralization can take place. In this case, water seeps into the organism or into the dead remain and over time it decays the original chemical substances within the dead remain and is replaced by other minerals. That means dinosaur is located where correct conditions exist for proper fossilization. After a certain thousands or millions of years later, erosion, earthquake, landslide, 
may expose the fossil and the fossil later be discovered by paleontologists. Fossil dating. How can we date fossils? That means how do we know how old a fossil is? There are two main methods determining a fossil's age, relative dating and absolute dating. Relative dating is used to determine a fossil's approximate age by comparing it to similar rocks and fossils of known ages. Relative dating rely on stratigraphy. This stratigraphy is the study of the layers of sedimentary rocks and the fossils that occur with sedimentary rocks to deduce how organisms have changed over time. In this case, the oldest strata and therefore the oldest fossils relatively will be in the lowest layers of the sedimentary rocks. More recent rocks and fossils in sedimentary rocks exist in layers above the oldest strata and most recent sediments and most recent fossils with this sediment exist being nearest to the surface of the sedimentary rock. So the depths of the strata is related to their age and the thickness of each stratum is a measure of the time period during which that stratum was formed. As we can see from the diagram, this fossil is the oldest fossil in this sedimentary rock and this fossil is the youngest or the most recent fossil relative to the other fossils in different strata of this sedimentary rock. The second type of fossil dating is actual or absolute dating by using radiometric dating. How do we actually date the rocks? We can actually or absolutely date the rocks or fossils by using radioactivity or radiometric techniques. Radiometric dating significantly depends on radioactive substances like carbon-14, uranium-235, potassium-40, uranium-238, thorium-232, rubidium-87. Each radioactive substances have its own half-life. Half-life means the time period needed for half of the atoms of a radioactive substance to decay. The half-life for carbon-14 to decay to nitrogen-14 is 5730. The half-life to uranium-235 to decay to lead-207 is 704 million years. The half-life for potassium-40 to decay to argon-40 is 1.3 billion years. The half-life for uranium-238 to decay to lead-206 is 4.5 billion years. The half-life for thorium-232 to decay to lead-206 is 14 billion years. And the half-life for rupidium-87 to decay to strontium-87 is 49 billion years. The various types of radioactive substances with its own half-life helps us to determine or calculate the ages of different fossils since different fossils have different ages. To determine the exact age of fossils, we can use the formula capital N is equal to N naught times epsilon the power of negative lambda times T. Capital N stands to the number of atoms of the parent isotope in the sample at time T. N naught stands to the initial value of radioactive substances. E or epsilon is natural logarithm of 2 and lambda is 
the decay constant of the parent isotope and T is the time period radioactive substances take to decay. The ratio of radioactive carbon-14 to the ordinary carbon-12 in living things is about 1 to 1 trillion. We believe that this ratio has always been the same during their lives. We know that living things like carbon-12 lose carbon-14 as carbon dioxide and other excretory products and gain it in the food they eat. But when living things die, carbon-14 starts to decay into non-radioactive nitrogen and clearly is not replaced. So, after 5,730 years, the half-life of carbon-14, only 50% of the original carbon-14 atoms will remain. So, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is 1 to 2 trillion or 0 0.5 to 1 trillion. After 11,460 years, 25% of the original carbon-14 atoms remain. The ratio can be 1 to 4 trillion or 0 0.25 to 1 trillion. The ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 keeps halving with each half-life that passes on. So, after 22,920 years, a fossil had only 6.25% of its original carbon-14 atoms. Generally, in the first half-life, at about 5,730, only 50% of carbon-14 decay and 50% of carbon-14 atoms remain in the fossil. In the second half-life, at about 11,460 years, only 25% of carbon-14 remain. In the third half-life, at about 17,190 years, only 12.5% of carbon-14 remain. In the fourth half-life, at about 22,920, only 6.25% of carbon-14 atoms remain in the fossil. And in the fifth half-life, at about 28,650, only 3.125% of carbon-14 atoms remain undecayed. Radiocarbon dating is really only accurate with rocks up to 60,000 years old because Carbon-14 atoms can be completely decayed and so it no longer helps us to determine the age of the fossil that existed on Earth for more than 60,000 years. In this case, we must use other radioactive substances that have more longer half-life like potassium argon, which has 1.3 million years half-life, which is suitable for dating rocks millions of years old. How does comparative anatomy support the theory of evolution? Comparative anatomy looks at structural similarities of organisms to determine their possible evolutionary relationships. Some organisms have anatomical structures that are very similar in form or setups, but very different in function. So, comparative anatomy assumes that organisms with similar anatomical features are closely related evolutionarily and that they probably share a common ancestor. As we studied before, comparative anatomy studies similarities and differences in organisms to provide evidence of common descent. There are two major concepts of comparative anatomy. These two major concepts of anatomy are 
homologous structures and analogous structures. Homologous structures are structures or body parts or anatomy which are similar in different species because the species have common descent or common ancestor and have evolved usually divergently from a shared ancestor or common ancestor. These homologous structures may or may not perform the same function. The best example is the four limbs of mammals, that is, the four limbs of human, whales, cats, and bats. As we can see from the image, the four limbs of those mammals possess or have the same number of bones that are arranged in almost the same way. You can see the humerus, radius, ulna, carpel, metacarpel, and phalanges or fingers of each mammals which are almost similar. That means these mammals have the same basic anatomy. This indicates that the evolvement from one common evolutionary origin or from one common ancestor. But the four limbs of these mammals have different function, that is, human four limbs or arm, arms are applicable to manipulate different tasks, four limbs of whales or flippers are used for swimming, four limbs of cats, what we call legs, used for running, and four limbs of bats, what we call wings, used for flying. These structures with the same basic anatomy have different function. This is because of different environmental factors or different niches that each mammal have adapted. Pentadactyl limb means a limb that has five fingers. The basic plan of Pentadactyl limb is a single long bone, what we call humerus, a pair of long bones, radius and ulna, a cluster of small bones, carpels in the wrist, and the five sets of metacarpels and digits or fingers that you can see from the image. Analogous structures. Analogous structures are structures similar in different organisms because of convergent evolution and they evolved in a similar environment rather than were inherited from a recent common ancestor. Analogous structures usually serve the same or similar functions or purposes. That means Analogous structures have different anatomical setups but similar function. Organisms that are not necessarily closely related but live in similar environments and have similar adaptations. These structures are morphologically and developmentally very different. These structures do not indicate that two species share a common ancestor. That means they evolved from different ancestors. For example, wings of birds and mosquito. When we see the setups of wings of birds, the bird wing has bones inside and is covered with feathers, whereas mosquito's wing is made from veins and cuticles that are extremely different from the setups of birds wings so these are analogous structures and have evolved separately from different ancestors both structures that is wings of birds and mosquitoes serve the same function even though their anatomies are very different this is due to similar environmental factors or niches that these animals have adapted. How does comparative embryology support the theory of evolution? Comparative embryology is a branch of embryology 
that compares the way in which the embryos of vertebrates develop before they hatch or born. This development shows similarities which support a common ancestry or common descent. As we can see from the image, the four vertebrates like lizard, tortoise, pig, and human being shows similar embryonic development. At early stage of embryonic development, follow very similar embryonic development pattern. But later stages, they follow different embryonic development pattern. As we can see, developmental stage of pigs and human, they are so similar from early stage to later stage. Lizard and tortoise also show more similar in all stages. This indicates that pig and human being have evolved from recent common ancestor, whereas lizard and tortoise also have evolved from recent common ancestors. In this case, human being and lizard are distantly related. They evolved from one common ancestor in the ancient time or distant past. Vertebrates have similar patterns of embryological development, mostly in the early stage. This is because all vertebrates have a basic set of genes, what we call homeobox genes that define the basic body plan of vertebrates. This operates in early development to ensure the development of common parts of all vertebrates like backbone and skull. Other genes that is different in different vertebrates define the development of those different features that will make them distinct species, what we call distinct genes. These distinct genes determine distinct features of different species of vertebrates. This is the reason why later stages of embryological development becomes different in different species of vertebrates, but the early stages are almost similar. That is due to the act of similar genes or homeobox genes. Comparative biochemistry. How does comparative biochemistry support the theory of evolution? Comparative biochemistry is a technique that uses biochemicals and biochemical pathways to determine the evolutionary relationships of different organisms. For this reason, various chemicals have been studied in order to find evidence of evolutionary relationships. The idea behind this is that if organisms share very similar molecules and biochemical pathways, then they must be closely related evolutionarily. Chemicals that have been used in such analysis include DNA and protein molecules. Protein molecules mostly include cytochrome C and hemoglobin. Comparative biochemists use the base sequences of DNA from different organisms to determine their relatedness. In case of protein, they use amino acid sequences of different organisms to determine their relatedness. That means if organisms share very similar molecules and biochemical pathways, then they must be closely related evolutionarily. They must evolve from recent common ancestor. Species that are closely related have most similar DNA and proteins. Those that are distantly related share fewer similarities. Comparison of DNA sequences shows that it is 99.9% .9 certain that chimpanzees are humans' closest relatives. That is, 98% of our DNA is the same as that of chimpanzees. To measure the similarity of one species' DNA with another species, we use a technique called DNA hybridization. This technique measures the extent to which a strand of DNA from one species can bind or hybridize with a strand of DNA from another species. To do this, there are certain experimental procedures or steps. 
steps can be. The double helix of the DNA molecule is heated to separate the DNA into its single strands. Then, the single stranded DNA or SS DNA from both species must be mixed and the mixture must be cooled down. There can be regions that are mismatched or the base pairs are not complementary and the information can then be used to calculate percentage of similarity of the DNA samples. To determine percentage similarity of each different species, we can calculate by using the formula percentage similarity is equal to number of base sequences that are matched over total number of base sequences of the whole DNA times 100. As we can see from the diagram, human DNA is compared with fly and chimpanzee's DNA. When a strand of human DNA hybridizes with fly, it is less conservative, which means less number of bases match with base sequences of flies. Flies strand of DNA, but when a strand of human DNA hybridizes with chimpanzee's DNA, chimpanzee's DNA strand it is more conservative. That means most base sequences match and less or few mismatch. We may share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees and 50% of our DNA with bananas. Differences in DNA are largely due to mutations. By using estimates of mutation rates, biologists can calculate how long it might have taken for a certain number of differences in DNA to have arisen. As we can see, a phylogenetic or evolutionary tree of some animals based on differences in DNA, Homo sapiens or human being is closest relatives to an troglodytes or common chimpanzee. But human being is distantly related with domestic fowl, African cloud frog, tropical cloud frog, zebra fish, human being and chimpanzee evolved from recent common ancestor, whereas human being and domestic fowl evolved from distant common ancestor. One of the protein molecule, hemoglobin molecule, is similar in all animals that possess this molecule, but there are some differences based on the number of polypeptide chain and the amino acid sequences in each polypeptide. For example, the hemoglobin of the lamprey, the primitive fish-like animal, has only one polypeptide chain, but the other most animals have hemoglobin with four chains. But the chains do vary based on their amino acid sequences. The evolutionary relationships of some animals like human, macaco, dog, bird, frog, and lamprey are shown in the following graph. Lamprey polypeptide chain of hemoglobin differs from human hemoglobin by 125 amino acids. Frog's hemoglobin differ by 67 amino acid with human being, birds by 45 amino acid, dog via 32 amino acid, and macaco differs by 8 amino acid from human being. The molecules that are used to show evolutionary relationships are those that are common to large numbers of organisms. But clearly, hemoglobin analysis cannot be used to include plants and algae in any phylogenetic theory. In this case, we should use another molecules of protein, what we call cytochrome C. Since cytochrome C exists in all animals and plants, evidence from plant and animal breeding First, let us see the impacts of selective breeding. What is selective breeding? This is a technique used to produce organisms with a desired trait by allowing only those organisms with that trait to reproduce. Means 
organisms with desired traits get increased and organisms with non-desired traits get reduced. For thousands of years, humans have been trying to improve the yields of their crop plants and stock animals through selective breeding. In this case, those animals or plants that show the desired trait are selected and mated. That means only those with desired trait are allowed to breed. Over many generations, selective breeding can bring about significant changes to the organisms involved in this selective breeding process. For example, wild pig or wild boar gets modified by selective breeding into many different varieties of domestic pig. If new varieties can be produced by selective breeding, then natural selection should also act on these varieties and let these varieties eventually evolve it into new independent species. This is the reason why selective breeding lets certain groups of populations or varieties of species evolve to new species.